You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Brought to you by Binary Space. Reliable space systems. Hello and welcome. Two million parts, all of them from the low bidder, as Wally Shira once famously quipped. Now, if you put those parts together just right, you've got yourself a space shuttle. The problem is just about every single one of them has to be working perfectly before a shuttle ever clears the tower. But exceptions can be made, and that is what the shuttle launch team is doing for this next launch. With Discovery sitting on the launch pad for its penultimate flight, a helium valve failed. The helium is used to make sure there is pressure in the fuel lines that feed the orbital maneuvering system engines, which handle big course changes in orbit. Fixing the valve means a rollback to the hangar and a big delay. So the shuttle team will try to verify that some regulators downstream of the valve are working just fine. If so, it means they will have confidence they have only lost one layer of redundancy and thus give Discovery its launching papers. NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or WISE, has captured an image Charles Foster Kane would have liked to see, Rosebud. This one is no sled, though. It's a cosmic blossom in a cluster of stars in the Berkeley 59, which sounds a little like a group of 60s anti-war radicals. Anyway, the blue dots are the stars, and they are formed by the orange dust cloud in the middle. And the green, those are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, of course. You can find those on Earth in barbecue pits. For some reason, I'm hungry. WISE is also hunting for asteroids, and it has found more than a dozen that are near to Earth, and we didn't even know they were there. You'd be wise to listen to this story, Chicken Littles. Amy Meiser is on a hunt that's not unlike searching for treasure on the beach. We think there are about as many grains of sand on this beach as there are stars in the entire universe. So the task of finding rare objects in the universe that we're interested in requires the maps that WISE is going to make. Three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff. WISE is the Wide Field Infrared Explorer, and it caught a ride to orbit on a Delta II rocket in December. Its goal is as big as the sky to spend nine months surveying every nook and cranny for objects that cannot be seen in visible light, but are as plain as day in the infrared spectrum. Meinzer is the deputy project scientist for WISE. She and her team at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory are already enjoying a daily feast of stunning and slightly sinister images from their spacecraft 326 miles, 525 kilometers overhead. Well, there's really nothing quite like the feeling of seeing something that you've worked on for years uh, blast off into the cosmos. It was just incredibly exciting to see it take off. And yet there was a sense of, wait a minute, this is, this is only the beginning. <laughs> as exciting as the launch was, it was really only a precursor to, to what's happening now. WISE is looking for stars that are just too cool. Perhaps there is one closer to our sun than Proxima Centauri, but the star is, say, a brown dwarf and cannot be detected any other way. And they're also looking for asteroids and comets that we cannot see otherwise. They've already found a little more than a dozen of them that are close to Earth. So these are objects whose orbits take them close to the Earth's orbit. It doesn't mean that they're going to hit the Earth. It just means that their orbits are similar to Earth's. That could be enough to give us pause. If WISE has found that many dark, near-Earth objects in three months, what could lie ahead? Something that has painted a bullseye on us? I asked JPL's director, Charles Alachi, about this. It's an important thing to be thinking about, isn't it? And yeah. Collectively, as human beings. No, absolutely. Because, uh, and the way I put it is, even though the likelihood is extremely low, but the consequences are extremely high. <laughs> so you it's have a to really take bad that. day. That's right. It will be a real bad day for all of us. So we that uh, you know, and we have the capacity now and the technical capability to at least look how do we address that issue, uh, be it the combination of robotic missions and possibly human missions that we are looking, you know, with the Johnson Space Center and so on. Uh, but how do we do human mission to asteroid, and could that help us addressing a bad day? But for Amy and her team, it's not just about the potential hazard. We know that most of the asteroids in the solar system, for example, live in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And yet, some of them get inside of Mars's orbit and actually approach the Earth's orbit. Why is this? Where do they come from? What's the origin of that population? And, and what does that tell us about the origin of our solar system as a whole? So these are some of the things we're going to be exploring with the WISE data set. 
We know what will happen to WISE eventually. The solid hydrogen block that keeps the telescope cold enough to see in the infrared spectrum will melt away, and then WISE will bow out, laying the groundwork for other telescopes to zoom in. WISE is a fairly small telescope. It's only about 40 centimeters. I like to say that it's small but mighty. <laughs> so it's very sensitive, even though it's such a small telescope. But what we'd like to do is take the more interesting targets that we find with WISE and follow them up with larger telescopes that are sort of like a telephoto zoom lens. So we can zoom in on the most interesting things with bigger telescopes like the Spitzer Space Telescope, Hubble, and eventually, hopefully, the James Webb Space Telescope. It's time now for our 90-second tour around the cosmos brought to you by Space Careers. Ever heard of a kamikaze comet? Well, check out this. These cool images come to us from the sun-gazing SOHO spacecraft run by the European Space Agency and NASA. It shows a comet diving right into the sun. But apparently there was some sort of Heaven's Gate suicide pact going on with the comets because some other smaller comets did the same thing. SOHO has never seen anything quite like this before. Here's a good name for a planet in a B-grade sci-fi movie, Corot 9 b It was found by the French satellite known as Corot, along with the European Southern Observatory's HARPS exoplanet Hunter. Corot 9 b is 1,500 light-years away from us toward the constellation Serpens, the snake. Astronomers say it is the first normal temperate exoplanet they can study in detail. Corot 9 b is the size of Jupiter and is mostly made of hydrogen and helium. No signs of any Corotians. And the universe sure could use a cleaning service. Would you look at this dust? These giant filaments of cold dust were captured by ESA's Max Planck satellite. The filaments are about 500 light years from the sun, virtually next door to us. The pink line near the bottom is the Milky Way. No one knows what makes the dust form these shapes. And here is a new look at a familiar spot in our solar system. New thermal images of Jupiter's great red spot, which is a storm the size of three Earths. The thermal image gives astronomers their first detailed look inside the storm. Scientists at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab captured the image using the European Southern Observatory, the Gemini Observatory in Chile, and Japan's Subaru Telescope in Hawaii. They say the spot is a lot more complex than they once thought. Time for us to deorbit for a bit. When we return, we'll swing by some interesting looking moons Rhea, Helene, and Phobos. And later, we'll tell you about the lost spacecraft recently found on our moon. And then for fun, we'll watch another chopper craft and see how the dummies fare. Stay with us. Welcome back. More great new images from the Martian moon of Phobos. They come from the European Space Agency's Mars Express spacecraft. The detail here is fantastic, about 4.4 meters or 14 and a half feet per pixel. Like our moon, Phobos always shows the same face to the planet. Mars Express is also analyzing Phobos to see what it's made of. It bears a lot of similarity to a carbonaceous asteroid, but some researchers believe it might be made up of rocky remnants from the days when Mars was being formed. Meanwhile, a little farther out in our solar system near Saturn, some other cool moons got a visit recently by an interplanetary robot. This one is named Rhea, and the ESA NASA spacecraft Cassini swooped down within 100 kilometers of the moon to get a sniff. Cassini's radar instrument performed scatterometry and radiometry measurements to try to determine what Rhea is made of. And then there's little Helene. No easy task to get a good flyby shot of something that small. And the Cassini team also released this cool image of Saturn's rings, partially obscured by the planet's shadow. Such a beautiful planet. My second favorite. And a Russian Soyuz capsule carrying a pair of International Space Station keepers made its way to the surface of my favorite planet the other day. U.S. astronaut Jeff Williams and Russian cosmonaut Maxim Suryev arrived on the steppes of Kazakhstan. Strong winds toppled the capsule on its side, but the spacefarers were no worse for the wear. You know, any landing you can walk away from, right? The orbiting outpost they left behind may be in space as long as 30 years, if all goes well. Technically and physically, that is. The leaders of the station program met in Tokyo this past week to discuss extending the station's life to 2028. That would mark the 30th anniversary of the arrival in orbit of the cornerstone of the station, the FGB, which we now call Zarya. The Obama-NASA budget earmarks money to keep the station aloft until 2020, but the engineers say there is no reason ISS cannot fly longer. Eventually, it'll need some new batteries. 
The White House is hoping to charge up some enthusiasm for its plans for NASA. The president is headed into the lion's den on tax day. He'll hold a summit on space at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where there are a lot of angry, unemployed, or soon-to-be unemployed space workers. Lots of talk the president may announce one more shuttle mission. And Florida Senator Bill Nelson did not throw cold water on that idea after an Oval Office meeting with Obama and Vice President Joe Biden. Nelson expressed optimism after the chat, calling it an excellent conversation. One of the big winners in the new space order has apparently been having some excellent conversations with potential customers. SpaceX is announcing it has inked a deal with satellite builder Loral to deliver one of its spacecraft to orbit as early as 2012. The announcement comes on the heels of that successful hot fire test of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. SpaceX is planning two dozen launches over the next five years. Loral says all those launches will mean it has an assured successful flight history in advance of its mission. The Pentagon is complaining that it didn't get enough advanced consultation from the White House before it released its plan to cancel the Back to the Moon program known as Constellation. The Under Secretary of the Air Force, Gary Payton, told a Senate subcommittee that retiring the shuttle and canceling the Ares 1 rocket may force Pratt & Whitney to double the price of its rocket engines. The overhead stays the same, even though the demand decreases. Payton is also concerned about the reliability of other space systems, like solar arrays and batteries, may diminish as time goes on. Suffice to say, the batteries on a long-lost Russian rover are now dead, but at least we know where to find it. NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter snapped a picture of the Lunokhold 2 buggy on the moon. A moonstruck astronomy professor, Phil Stuck, found it when he saw some new LRO images hit the web. The Russians launched Luna Code, which means moonwalker, in 1973, drove it around for four months before it got stuck in a crater. No one was sure exactly where it was. Luna Code is owned by Richard Garriott, son of Skylab astronaut Owen Garriott, and a computer game creator worth millions. He bought himself a trip on a Soyuz to the space station in 2008. Twelve years ago, he bought Luna Code at auction for $68,500, shipping and handling not included. Listen up, all you blue-suited, white-scarved, Mark 25 flyboys and girls. If you're looking for work, and I know many of you are these days, you may want to consider this. Bigelow Aerospace, the company that is building inflatable orbiting satellites that founder Robert Bigelow would like to one day run as hotels, is looking to hire you. The astronaut positions are permanent, and applicants must have completed a government space training program and have some spaceflight experience. The times are a-changing in low-Earth orbit. The Enterprise never made it to low Earth orbit. It was designed to test the flying characteristics of a space shuttle orbiter. And today it sits in the Air and Space Museum's Udvar-Hazy facility at Dulles Airport. But not for long. An 11-member team from shuttle prime contractor United Space Alliance went to the museum to make sure Enterprise could be cleared for flight to a museum yet to be named. After Discovery flies her last flight, she will take Enterprise's spot. Shuttle curator Valerie Neal told CollectSpace.com there were no showstoppers. Bernard Harris is the kind of person who doesn't let showstoppers get in the way of his mission. The retired astronaut, physician, and businessman is now working hard to inspire young people to embrace technical fields. I spoke with Bernard a few weeks ago. Bernard Harris, thanks for being with us on This Week in Space. Lots of things happening in the space world uh, with NASA. The new Obama budget uh, really sends NASA on a, in a different direction. I'm curious, what, what are your thoughts on it, first of all? Well, you know, uh, I think everybody's a little worried about the cancellation of the Constellation program, of course, that, that makes a lot of folks uh, worry, especially in the JSC community and the, and the Kennedy community. But I think when it's all said and done, this, this whole movement toward commercial space uh, really is going to make sense in the long run. Yeah, it's space for the rest of us, isn't it? You got it. You got it. I remember when I uh, first got in the astronaut office, I, I was interviewed, and and the question from the commentator was, when were we going to? When was the uh, there was going to be an opportunity for just uh, regular folks to go up in space? And I predicted that it was going to be about ten years. Of course, I was woefully uh, under underestimated it. It's going to take a little bit longer, but I think this uh, brings us closer to that day. Of course, the rap on the program is, and everybody wants to see a vibrant commercial sector, the rap on the program is that there's no 
destination, no, no date, no specific mission that is out there for people to latch on to. You deal with a lot of kids across all socioeconomic uh, spectrum. How much does that matter to them? You know, uh, I, I don't know. And maybe I should say I, I do know and I don't know. Let me just give you from this standpoint. I think that when I go and speak to young people and tell them that I'm an astronaut and tell them what I do, uh, number one, they're very excited about that. They're very excited about space. I think when I speak to uh, even adults, they're excited about what we're doing, doing there. Um, I do mention, you know, before the, the cancellation of the program that we were going to the moon and Mars, and, and of course that opens up the eyes of, uh, of folks that that's a possible destination. Um, but I think they're just driven by the notion that human beings are leaving this planet. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific date or location as we were accustomed to those of us who grew up in the space race. Yeah, but with that said, you know, I, I think for any program to be viable long term, there must be some objective of the program. And I think that after we get over the initial shock of the idea of commercial space, I, I think that uh, Charlie Bolden and his team will, will come up with a, what I consider to be a, a reasonable uh, destination for us. Uh, and if you think about it, you know, how many more places can we go? Uh, realistically besides the moon and Mars. That's pretty much all we got right now. Let's, uh, let, let's talk about where, how NASA fits into all this when it comes to the so-called STEM issue, science, technology, engineering, and math, and how kids are not embracing it as they did a generation or so ago. You're actively involved with this with the Harris Foundation. Tell us a little bit about uh, what NASA can or should be doing to try to engage kids better. Well, let me first say that NASA has been involved with trying to engage kids for many years. Uh, with our foundation, the Harris Foundation, we've, we've been involved uh, with NASA through the years. In fact, they have uh, su supported a number of our programs, our summer science camp in the past, uh, which is now being supported by the ExxonMobil Foundation. Uh, but they have been involved quite a bit. And they were probably one of the first uh, organizations to recognize that there was going to be this workforce issue uh, long term and uh, of course it was self-serving in the sense that they realized that the engineers that, that were currently at NASA were aging and that there was not this generation, this new generation coming about. So uh, that's why that was such a push and I think that push is even greater now uh, given the fact that uh, it's an issue across the nation, it's an issue across um, most companies when they look out to see who's going to be the, the next scientists and engineers and, and technicians that's going to lead us in the future. All right, well, keep, keep encouraging them for us, will you? Bernard Harris, who runs the Harris Foundation, among many other things. Thanks for your time. My pleasure. Our little planet is just brimming with life. And in fact, scientists are no longer surprised to find living things under just about every frozen rock or deep beneath the sea. But this one caught them off guard. You're looking at shrimp that live at a depth of 600 feet below the Antarctic ice sheet. A NASA National Science Foundation expedition made the amazing find in November. Now, the team expected to find, well, shrimpier forms of life, you know, microbes. The fact that shrimp live here has stumped them. They're not exactly sure what they eat. But it does make you wonder what might be under the ice sheets of Jupiter's moon, Europa, doesn't it? So why aren't we sending a mission there? Just asking, and I guess if we go, we should pack some cocktail sauce. We end the program today with more proof there is nothing more fun than watching things crash, so long as just a few dummies bear the brunt of the impact. The place is NASA's Langley Research Center in Virginia, the object to test a Kevlar honeycomb cushion that might save lives in a chopper crash one day. In December, they tried a 35-foot drop with the cushion, and this is what happened. Now, we're told this was survivable, but the other day they did the same test without the cushion. Same chopper, same dummies, same sensors, and here's what happened. There was a lot more damage, and the dummies took a 40G wallop. Three times the impact on the first test. Not good for the dummies, but for the smarties who dreamed up the Kevlar cushion, a good day indeed. So kids, study hard. You don't want to grow up to be a dummy. 
The smart thing for me to do right now is call it quits. And uh, before we go, let's check the mailbag. Dan Armstrong wrote this nice note on Facebook. I think this production is just plain super. I'm so impressed with the depth and thought put into the program, the independence of the production, and your direct-to-consumer approach. Good stuff. Wow. Thanks, Dan. Fred Bull sent this email from Georgia. Miles, I know you're enthusiastic about what the White House is proposing, but why is everyone so optimistic that these lofty plans will be executed? It's about like the optimism at the beginning of the Iraq War, that we'd be out of there in three months. Well, Fred, we can say for certain there are weapons of mass destruction in space, asteroids. Thanks, as always, for the feedback. Feel free to weigh in on Facebook or send an email to twist at spaceflightnow.com. Or if you have a short attention span, send us a tweet at This Week in Space or visit the blog milesobrien.com. While you're on our site, please consider sending us a small donation. We're still trying to make this as financially viable as it is fun. And a special shout out to our sponsors this week, Binary Space and Space Careers. We really appreciate your support. Next week, we'll take you behind closed doors at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab and show you how they're building the largest Martian rover ever. The Mars Science Laboratory is the size of a Mini Cooper, and its arrival on the Red Planet will be a major technical feat. Even the people on this team wonder if they're trying to do too much at once. The hard road back to Mars, next time on This Week in Space. We'll see you then.